Well, good morning. You're looking lovely. I only ever see the back of your head, so nice to look at the, the front sometimes. Except for the pastor, of course. It's a joy to be with you, and, to, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to minister the Word of God. I can remember a number of years ago hearing of uh, somebody in America who had a ministry that took him here, there, and yonder. But he had an association with a local church. And uh, he came home from one of his visits at one stage. And uh, as he got up, he, he said to the church, Now then, he said, I want to tell you that I appreciate you letting me up here to speak to you. Because, he said, I see you a bit like... Uh, uh, I'm looking for the word. An aircraft carrier. He says, and, and I'm a wee aeroplane. I'm flying here, there, and yonder. I land on the aircraft carrier. I get refilled, and then I'm away again. And uh, I feel a bit like that. Over the past few months, God has been very good in opening doors for ministry. And so we've been appreciating the fact that the Lord had kept us busy. It's terrible to get slow and slow down. And, you know, 60, he said he was last week. Eh? Your turn is coming, son. There you go. If you have your Bible with you, will you turn please to Hebrews chapter 11. Just a few verses from verse 23. Hebrews chapter 11. Well-known portion of the Word of God. Verse 23 says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months by his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, essaying or trying to do, were drowned. Amen? God will bless us that reading from his own precious word. My main theme this morning is knowing God. But as a kind of sidebar to that, a question of choices. In Luke chapter 15, you have the story of the prodigal son. And uh, the crucial point in that particular story, it seems to me, is that it says, quite simply, when he came to himself, he'd been away from himself. He was, he was at a distance from where he ought to be. But when he came to himself, he started thinking rationally and clearly. Moses, we are told here in Hebrews 11 and 24, when he was come to years. And I wondered about what come to years meant. Did that mean, mean that he somehow or other reached uh, 18 years of age like we would have it, or 21 years of age? But thinking it through, he must have been about 40 when he made this decision. He was 40 years in Egypt. He was 40 years in the backside of the desert. And then he was 40 years leading the people through the wilderness. So we're really talking about a man here who at the age of 40 made a choice. And the choices are what we're going to look at uh, this morning for a little while. And there's a background. Let me give you one text. Daniel 11 and verse 32 says, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And so the big question that arises out of that is, how do you know God? How do you get to know God? How well do you know God? And we're not talking here to children. There's another part of the Bible which says, as Paul writes to one of the churches, he says, let's leave aside the ABCs of the gospel. Let's move on from that. We understand what salvation's about. Now, we need to grow up in Christ. And as we grow in Christ, our knowledge of God must increase. And it seems to be, this is 
crucial for the local church because worship, by very definition, indicates it comes from the words worth-ship. And so the question is, what worth do I place on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? If I treat him as somebody who's just around and I talk to him, I say my prayers and I go to bed, then worth-ship is not going to be very meaningful. But if we learn to love him, if we learn to know him in a very deep and a very real sense, then there will be an expression of gratitude towards him that cannot be kept in, that cannot be held back, that must find some kind of expression. And so the few verses that we're looking at concerning Moses today, I trust will draw us closer to an understanding of who Jesus is and of our relationship to him. And it all begins in verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now notice we've moved past verse 24. And in doing so, we've established the fact that we're not talking about a teenager here. We're talking about a man of mature years. A man whose very birth was fraught with danger because at the time of his birth, there was an edict from the king, from the pharaoh of Egypt, to say all little children that age should be, should be killed. His mother, of course, wasn't prepared to do that. She didn't believe in abortion. Isn't that great? Not even postpartum abortion, which is something very regular in the world today. And so he grew up, and you know the story, we'll not go, go into that and take time this morning. You know how he became the son of Pharaoh's daughter? How he was schooled in all the things that Egypt had to offer. He was educated. He was party to all the uh, privileges of a royal household. Everything going for him from a human standpoint. But verse 25 says, He chose at the age of 40 rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. What did that mean? Look at verse 37. Verse 37 says, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And there's a few verses on either side of that that highlights exactly what being afflicted with the people of God meant. And so you can imagine that Moses, somehow or other, and there are one or two questions that we will leave with you for you to think about, and eat when you're having your dinner. Because you should be doing that rather than chewing over the sermon. Isn't that right? So we need some questions for you to, to chew on when you go home. But you see, here's a question. How did he understand, how did he know what the affliction would be relative to the people of God? Well, of course, for 40 years he had seen the Israelites, the Hebrews that were there, laboring under slavery. He had grown up in a privileged situation, but he was not averse to liquor looking out the window and seeing how his people were getting on. And of course, it all came to a crunch when he defended two Hebrews. One Hebrew against an Egyptian in the first place, and then two Hebrews who were having a fight. And out of that, he found himself exiled to the backside of the desert. But here's the choice that he made. Suffering affliction. Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 and 18, talks about affliction. He says, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, where we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And it becomes obvious as you study this particular passage relative to Moses that Moses had an insight into those things which were invisible. He didn't just live in the tangible. He didn't just live with the things that he could see round about him. He had an insight. He had a mental knowledge. He had a spiritual understanding that there was something beyond the here and now. And that somehow or other, 
by some kind of an intuition, maybe by the Spirit of God speaking in his heart, he understood and realized that there was something that was more important than the things that he could get a grasp on with his hands. James 5 verse 10 says, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Moses endured for 40 years. It couldn't have been easy even growing up in such a privileged setting to be able to look aside and to see how the Hebrews were being treated. Because don't forget his mother. What's the name of the mother and father of where's all the young folk that have all the knowledge? Mother and father of Moses and Moses. Good on you. Amram and Jochebed. Okay. So Jochebed was a Hebrew. And as she had a little child to, to bring up, she would teach him all the ways of the Hebrews. He would know all about God. She would make sure that he never forgot what his roots really were. And so when he came 40 years of age, the Bible says he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. So there's the priority that he chose. But then, side by side with that, there was the pleasure that he rejected. Notice what the second half of that verse says. Than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. We ought to be sure. We ought not. I think we've moved beyond, actually, the days when we used to say, if you're not saved, you must be downright miserable. It doesn't go like that. There is pleasure in sin. Otherwise, people wouldn't do it. The folks who smoke love to smoke. The people who like to drink like to drink. The folks who are hooked on pornography love looking at pornography. The people who are into internet rubbish are into internet rubbish. They love it. It's great. The only problem is that when they've finished this bit, they've got to go to the next bit. And when that bit's done, they've got to go to the next bit. And it's never, ever satisfying. There is pleasure in sin. In fact, look around at some of the sinners that you know and I know, and we're sinners together, and we can see that they're happier than some of us. Isn't that right? If I was a good American, I'd say, turn to your neighbor and say, you're looking right miserable today. Aren't you glad I'm not an American? But you see, this is the question, isn't it? In his choice that he made... He recognized that there were pleasures in sin. And as far as Egypt was concerned, he had everything going for him. There was no money. What is? There were no challenges to him in the kind of human activities, fleshly activities that he could have put his finger on and he could have been partner to. The whole of the, the, the palace of Pharaoh was open to him. He could please himself. He could do whatever he liked. But something inside him said, this is only a seasonal thing. This will only last for a little while. One of the challenges we as Christians today have to look at is the question of, what do we do for pleasure? I hear a lot of people praying for revival. We had a a minister session last year, not this year, but last year, we started the year with a whole day of prayer. And the big prayer was, let's pray for revival. Let's pray for revival. And so they did. All the ministers gathered together and they got their heads down and they began shouting to the Lord, please send revival, please send revival. And I'm sorry, but I sat there and I thought, you're never going to see it, son. Why? Because your lifestyle doesn't measure up. If you go to 2 Corinthians 7, 14, it says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. Some of these guys didn't know what humble meant. Give up your wicked ways. They'd rather go and see Manchester United than be in church on Sunday morning. Some of these folk. Oh, boy. Mm. See, that's my ancient past coming out. Christians didn't go to football matches. But I'll tell you something else. When I first came to Ireland, I met a man in the Irish executive. His name was Sammy Kelly. 
Sammy was a lovely man. If you're old enough to remember some of the conventions, Sammy was the guy who would get up and lead the choruses before the service got started. What I discovered about Sammy was this. He was a professional footballer with Linfield until he got saved. The minute he got saved, he gave up his football career. Now, why? Because at that time, now I know it's different today. Don't get yourself in a twist, for goodness sake. I know it's different today. But in those days, in those days, Sammy Kelly could not see as it being compatible with his newfound Christian faith that he would play football professionally. So it's a challenge. So the question is, I'm making it general this morning for you to think about. We're talking about getting to know God. What is it that gets in the way of us knowing God? I think some of our pleasures, things which in themselves are possibly not sinful. But the Bible, you see, talks about not laying aside the sins which so easily beset us, but laying aside the weights. I mean, we can all look around and say, well, I, I, I'm not given to known sin. I, I try not to sin. Well, of course you do. If you're a sensible Christian, you, you don't have to take that view. But the question is, what kind of weights are we carrying? What is it holding us back? What is it hanging, you know, pulling us down? Forty years of age, the priority he chose. He wants to suffer affliction with the people of God. If I identify myself with them, I will put myself in harm's way, but I don't care. I'm leaving. Well, if you leave, you know that all the benefits and all the blessings and all the pleasures that you could have in the palace, you will not get access to anymore. I do not care. They only last for a little while anyway. And there's something better on ahead. So we move from the pleasure who rejected to verse 26, which talks to us about the reproach that he valued. Now this is getting difficult. Very difficult. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Let me ask you a question. Jean asked me a question just before we, we started the service. Morning. She says, how are you going to talk about Moses from Hebrews? I said, you want me to read Exodus? But Moses is here in Hebrews, one of the faithful. Here's my question. The question for you to take home with your dinner. All right. How did Moses, living in the book of Exodus, know anything about the reproach of Jesus Christ? who was not born for thousands of years after Moses. How did he know that? What was it that spoke to his heart? What was it that God put in his spirit that made him to know there's something different, there's something more, and I want it? You and I can be very content. We can say, well, I go to church on a Sunday. Thank you very much. Is that the end of it? What about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Do we live for God then? Do we take a stand for Jesus then? Do people around us that we work with, that we meet with, know whose we are and whom we serve? The reproach of Jesus Christ. Peter said in 1 Peter 4 and verse 14, he says, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. He makes the point. Don't get reproached because you're an evildoer. Don't get a reproach on your life because you've done something bad or wicked. I mentioned to somebody not so long ago that uh, in my very first church there was a man not coming. But I heard about him. And I said to them, tell me about him. They said, well, he, he, he's a fine man. That's good. He sells cars. Better still. I didn't ride a car. I had a motorbike and that was it. Why is he not coming to church? Ah, uh, well, um, it's a wee bit difficult. See, he's just out of jail. Why did he go to jail? 
for embezzlement. Oh dear. But then the story expanded a wee bit. And they began to tell me this. When he was caught, his friends gathered round him to commiserate with him. And the basis on which they commiserated was, isn't it a shame you got caught? Not isn't it terrible that you embezzled? Not isn't it awful that you stole from these people? Isn't that a pity you got caught? Mm. Reproach. Peter says, don't get reproached because you're an evildoer. If you get reproached because you're a Christian, because you're an out-and-out child of God, then fine, happy are ye. You can feel contented. No matter what the outside world is saying or doing round about you, no matter what kind of turmoil you're involved in, know this, that in your heart of hearts you are acceptable to Almighty God, and God is pleased and you can be happy. That's not a bad situation, sure it's not. The reproach he valued. What have we got about reproach? Jesus said it. Luke chapter 6, verse 22. He said, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. Can you see it? I can't. Sorry. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Jesus said, have a, lot, have a jump. Have a wee praise meeting for yourself. Because these people think you're rubbish. Because I know you're not. And I know your name's written in heaven. And I know one day you're going to be there. And the whole benefits of heaven are going to be yours. Get excited about it now. Leap for joy. Oh. We go to Calabac Elam. The only time I've seen some of you leaping for joy is when you're downstairs getting your tea and buns. You know that? But isn't there a challenge to every one of us that something in our demeanor, something in the way we live, something in the way we approach life in general says to other people, I don't care. I'm on God's side and God's on my side. I'll tell you something for nothing. I don't worry about the Syrian situation. It's bad. The ISIS thing is terrible. But I'm not worried about it. Because no matter how dark it gets in this world in which we live, there is a God in heaven who never takes his hand off the driving wheel. Never does. Even though we can't understand which way it's going or why it's going in that direction or why this one and that one has to perish or why there are earthquakes and why there are tornadoes and all the rest of it, my God is in control. And you see, that's what knowing God is all about. It's like the wee girl who got on the train and somebody said to her, are you not scared? She says, no. Well, they said, you're just by yourself. She says, I'm not. My daddy's a train driver. What's to be scared about? In fact, the reverse situation, as far as the ISIS thing is concerned, is, is true for us. I mean, they're all desperate to die, not knowing that hell waits for them. We're desperate to live, knowing that heaven's there, and we don't want to get there. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Sure, if they chop my head off, please not yet, but if they chop my head off, I am going immediately into the presence of the King of Kings. That's reality, friends. That's not pie in the sky when you die. That is the reality of knowing God. And if you don't know that reality, if you're living a life that is fraught with worry and, and weariness and, and scared of what the next news is going to say, friends, you need to get to know your God. Because the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So there's a strength in here, but there's an exploit out there waiting for us. What have we got here then? 1 Timothy 4 verse 10, Paul says, We both labor, labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Do you believe this morning? Are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Do you live your life believing? Do you get up in the morning believing? Do you go to bed at night thanking God for the day that you've survived and believing? And like the dweeb child from hundreds of years ago saying, Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And he will. He will. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Reproach. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11, 13, 12. Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, outside the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Why? For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. This, heaven, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Okay? Are you? Are you putting down roots? I meet people occasionally, you know, and they'll say to me, I've lived in this house since I was born. And how old are you? Well, I'm 92. I never lived anywhere from I was born. A few months here, a few years there, some more years here, some more years there. You don't get a chance to put down roots. You don't want to put down roots. Why? Because there's a place in heaven Waiting for my home is in heaven, just waiting for me. Okay, a mansion that God is preparing, promised to me. My name's on it. There's a wee bit in that wee chorus which says, "And the rent is free," which means that it's good for a Balamina man. Okay, and a Scot, if you like. Happy days, happy days, reproach. But then it goes on. He's not done yet. You see, in verse 26, it also says that he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. It wasn't pie in the sky when you die. He wasn't clutching at straws. He, he wasn't sort of building a house on a spider's web. He had a foundation for what he was doing. And in that sense, he, he, he wasn't very much like Abraham. You know, God says to Abraham, get thee out of thy country to a land that I will show thee. So he packs his bags and he, he gets all the stuff on the horses and the donkeys and he's leaving and his friend said to him, where are you going? I don't know. Why are you going? I don't know. When will you come back? I don't know. But there's Noah. What are you doing? I'm building a boat on dry land. There's not any water for miles. All these strange people doing strange things. Why? Because they have a knowledge of God. And you need to be aware that if you have a knowledge of God that is active and effective in your life, he might ask you to do strange things. He might tell you to do stupid things. There's a story told of Smith Wigglesworth, the Bradford plumber. God says, go speak to that house. So he went over and he spoke to the house. He said, you need to get saved. They thought, no, speaking to the house isn't the way to do it. So he hammered on the door. And there was no answer. He said, I tried. He left, went through the garden gate, headed down the road. And God said to him, speak to that house. So he went back and he got on his hands and knees. And opened the letterbox and began to shout through the letterbox, God loves you, you need to be saved. There he says, I did it. Got up off his hands and knees, headed down the path, got to the gate and the door opened. The man said, did you shout through my letterbox? He says, I did. He says, I was standing on my kitchen table with a rope round my neck ready to commit suicide. Is it true that God loves me? And Wigglesworth led that man to Christ. There and then. Why? Because he was obedient to God telling him to do something stupid. We think that because we're Christians, we're not supposed to be stupid. We're not supposed to do daft things. Let me tell you that the Bible is full of people doing daft things because God told them to. And if you and I know God, we need to be sensitive to what he's saying. Recompense, he respect. He had respect. In other words, he'd worked it out in his own mind. He thought, this is worthwhile. 
Hebrews 2, verses 2 and 3, If the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? We preach that to the gospel, as a gospel message, don't we? Nothing to do with the gospel. Nothing to do with the gospel. To do with you and me. It is God saying, hey, if you neglect your salvation, you will not grow in the things of God. You will not grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. If you neglect the gospel, then you will find yourself looking at different things, not understanding the recompense of reward that God has prepared for those who love him. How different in Hebrews 10 and verse 34. You took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Listen to that wee phrase. Knowing in yourselves. What's he saying? He's saying there's something inside you. That tells you this is real. There's something inside you that assures you that God has your best interests at heart. Those of you who drive cars, do you ever drive to a place you've never been before? Forget your sat nav for a wee minute. Can you do that? I don't have one. Don't want one. But I've seen me driving down a wee road, knowing where I'm supposed to be, and thinking to myself, this is not the right road. Maybe it is the right road. You've never been here before. How would you know? It doesn't feel like the right road. Something inside me is getting all scrunched up and saying, I'm on the wrong road. I need to go somewhere else. So what do you do? Well, if you're one of these stubborn drivers, you'll drive in as big a circle you can find because you don't like going back where you've been. If you've got any sense, you'll turn around, go back to where you started, and start all over again. Knowing in yourself, having an inner witness, having an understanding in your mind and in your spirit that there is something beyond what you see and what you know and what you hear here. It's a challenge, isn't it? Isn't it a challenge? The recompense that he respected. He had thought it through. He had worked it out. He had done his sums. He's a bit like the Apostle Paul in Romans 8 who said, I reckon. That's a great word, isn't it? Somebody said, I don't use my ready reckoner because it's, it's, you know, it's about two years out of date. Think that one through when you're at your dinner. Two and two was four then, and it's still two and two is still four now. There's a wee clue. Some of you are sitting there looking very puzzled. But Paul said it. He said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed. What does that word reckon mean? Reckon means you add it all up. Reckon means you get the balances out. Reckon means you put some on this side and some on that side until they even up. And when they even up, you know you've got balance. Some people say, well, I don't reckon anything. I, I don't reckon this. I don't reckon. Paul says, you reckon. You reckon. And in your relationship to Almighty God, in knowing God, in coming to understand God, in feeling for God. That's a strange word, isn't it? Feeling after him, the Bible says. Reaching out and touching him. One of the amazing things about the Middle East at the moment is a number of people who are Muslim backgrounds who are coming to know Jesus as Savior and as Lord because in the night time they are having dreams and visions and they're reaching out to this person. Very strange. 
doesn't happen here. No, it doesn't. We're too logical, us. You need to be spiritual. You need to have some kind of a spirit sensitivity. But the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to people in impossible situations and saying, you need to talk to me. We heard, while I was still on the, uh, on the council for the Congo mission, we heard of uh, a person who was an imam in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And he had that kind of an experience. He saw this person who said to him, go to such and such a place and ask them to tell you about me. He'd seen this man in a long white robe with beard and all the rest of it. And he went to this place and he knew that they were Christians. And he wasn't too sure about going in there, but he went in and he said, I, I saw this person in the night time and he said, I have to come to you and you have to tell me about him. And so they did and they led him to the Lord. What did the imam do? He went back to his mosque and he said to his people when they came for prayer, I want to tell you what happened to me last night. And the whole mosque got saved. Isn't that amazing? Further in the south of Ethiopia, they, these, are, these are accredited things. Further in the south of Ethiopia, because the Christians in Ethiopia started planting churches, the Islamic folk started building mosques every five miles down the main road. And then all the Islamic people who went to the mosque got themselves saved. So the mosque became churches. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Knowing God makes a difference. Listen to the word. Verse 27. Here's the bottom line of it, really. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. Isn't that it? You live your life every day seeing the invisible. You live your life every day knowing the unknowable. I have a message that I sometimes preach on the basis of uh, Paul uh, in Athens. The unknown God. I said he's unknown, but he's not unknowable. He may be unknown to a person at a certain time, but he's not unknowable. He is willing to be known. And that's where you and I come in. Not sitting in church, but out there, back home, in the workplace, wherever God takes you, letting people know who you are. And whom you serve. I've said it here before. I'm saying it again. Are you ready? Repetition is not a bad thing. Next time you're in, where am I going to go this time? I've got to think sometimes because people laugh at me when I say where I go. If you go into Tesco's or Sainsbury's, that's kind of kosher, isn't it? Me, I go to Lidl's and Poundland. But if you go to Tesco's or Sainsbury's, Instead of using one of those automatic things at the end, go to one of the wee girls that's serving and taking your money. And when she's taking your money, say, thank you, love, and God bless you. And she'll go home absolutely shocked, shattered. And she'll say to her mommy, there was a woman came through here today and she said, God bless you. What does that mean? Because even here in Northern Ireland, there are people who do not know God. One of the most amazing things to me years ago when I was in the temple. I had in the temple the, the uh, CEF, man for South Belfast, Fred Rainey. And Fred came in one day and he said to me, we have met children. He was doing open air holiday clubs in, in the Ormo Road. He said, we have met children coming into our club who do not have access to a Bible. Can you imagine that in South Belfast? They don't have a Bible. Friends, we are living in what's called a post-Christian era. And if you and I are not strong and doing exploits for God, then nobody knows. And if nobody knows, how will they hear? Romans 10, how will they hear without a preacher? You don't have to be a preacher standing up here. You're a preacher out there living your life. The people that do know their God. Make up your mind this morning. I'm going to get to know my God more. I'm going to get to see what's not seen regularly. I'm going to touch the unseen. I'm going to get a grip on the invisible. And I'm going to let God have his way in my life. 
May God bless and give to us the kind of spirit that Moses had that will enable us to endure whatever comes because we can see him who is invisible. The Lord bless his word to our hearts this morning. Amen.